Hi, and welcome to Allen High School's AP IB Chemistry class. We're currently in the midst of our discussion on acids and bases, and right now we're moving into the concept of buffers. Now, a buffer we saw when we had our titration curve, we saw, you know, visually that a buffer resists changes in pH when small amounts of acid or base are added. Well, small is defined by how much buffer is present in the first place. So if you take a look at a reaction, you've got some weak acid, that's a common notation. Sometimes you'll see HX as a common notation for a weak acid. And if you add hydroxide, a small amount of base, it will react with the acid and shift our equilibrium. Remember good old Le Chatelier. And we will shift the equilibrium in response to that. The H plus, whoops, will react with that conjugate base of our weak acid. And again, you'll see a shift. So the key here is that there's an ability to shift. So what that means is we have to have an equilibrium. It has to be weak. So let's take a look at some possibilities. We want to select a buffer system, and we're going to do it by finding a weak acid whose pKa is close to the pH at which we want to buffer. Conversely, we can use a weak base system at which point the pKb is going to be equal to the pOH. So that would be key here. We'd be looking for a pKb near the pOH. And as if you remember, we had the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, which I think is very helpful here, plus the log of our conjugate base concentration over our acid. Now in an ideal buffer, these are very, very close to equal, which would cancel that term. They don't have to be equal to one another, but they're approximately equal to one another. So that approximates one, uh, which makes my pH and my pKa very close to one another. Now, if we were dealing with a base system, the base form is pOH is equal to pKb plus the log of my conjugate acid over my base concentration. Again, we want these approximately equal to one another. That term would come very close to canceling. And my pOH and my pKb are going to be very close to one another. Now, no, they don't have to be equal. I had a student think that once, and so I've worked hard to emphasize that. They need to be close to one another, though, for a good buffer, to have a good buffer that can handle both acid and base additions. Now, the ter another term you'll see is the buffer capacity. A capacity is an ability to. So it's the ability to absorb H plus and OH minus. And what we're looking at here is the actual concentrations, not just the relative, but the actual concentrations. So situations in which the conjugate in the base or the conjugate base in the acid have higher concentrations, then you're going to have a higher buffering capacity. We still want them to be equal to one another, so I'm just gonna pick random numbers. Let's say one molar compared to, just so you don't know, it doesn't have to be exact, compared to 0.9 molar is going to have a very differing buffer capacity than 0.01 molar compared to 0.009 molar, right? This ratio, even though the ratios are the same, this ratio here would have the higher buffering capacity. Okay, so that's some terminology. Let's take a look at physically how we make a buffer. All right, there's a couple of ways that we can get our goal. Our goal is to have both the weak and its conjugate present. We have to have both because we have to have the ability to shift in both directions. So we have to have an equilibrium set up where we have some product and some reactant present already. So you can think of it very much like a common ion situation. So some examples might be acetic acid and sodium acetate. Acetic acid, one way to write this that shows that 
carboxylic acid group, let me make it even more explicit, there would be my carboxylic acid group, that would be acetic acid. What sodium acetate donates to the situation is this because all sodium salts are soluble. I don't care about sodium in an aqueous solution, but that gives me a weak acid plus the conjugate base. So we want to add these in roughly a 50-50 mixture, okay? Approximately a one to one molar ratio. Not mass, but molar ratio. Now, another way we could do this, another situation could be a weak base. So if we had ammonia and we added ammonium chloride, all right, these aren't reacting together. What happens is this ends up being in my equilibrium. I'd get ammonium, so that's my equilibrium there. Okay, I have to add water for you to see that clearly. I'm adding this, adding ammonia, and by adding ammonium chloride, that gives me an initial concentration here. So I have some weak base, and I have some of its conjugate acid to begin with. A buffer has to have some of each. Now, another way to do this would be to add a weak and the opposite strong. Now notice this time we're doing it in a roughly two to one ratio. I think this is getting a little tricky now. Let me show you some numbers. And I think you'll see why we want it to be in a roughly two to one ratio. Now this is acetic acid. All right, it's written in a different form. You really do need to be uh, familiar with both ways of writing these things. So this is acetic acid, this is acetate. Now, in this case we have a stoichiometry because we have a strong base. Now that strong base could have come from KOH, lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, we don't really care. All we care about is that a hydroxide. Now, any acid in any base is a stoichiometry till one of them runs out. And fortunately, in acid-base chemistry, we deal so much with that one-to-one -one ratio. I think it makes our problems a little bit easier. So I said approximately a two-to-one. So here I've got my weak acid and my strong base approximately two times. Okay, well, that's not the greatest color here. I'll switch here. So it's going to go until the limiting runs out. This is my limiting. So I lose 0.45, I lose 0.45, and I gain 0.45. My strong goes to zero. My weak still has 0.55. Don't care much about water. I need it there, but not in terms of quantitatively. And I have some of its conjugate. I have a buffer. I have a weak acid and some of its conjugate base, and they're in roughly a one-to-one -one ratio. Now here would be a base example. Here's a weak base. I add some sort of strong acid. I could be adding HNO3, I could be adding HCl, could be adding HBr, I really don't care. The point is it's strong and I get H plus into the party. Right? Now remember I said I want this to be approximately double, two times my strong. Any acid plus any base, weak or strong, is a stoichiometry, goes 100% till my limiting runs out. You make your strong, the strong has to be the limiting. You still have to have some of that weak. So my strong is the limiting, it's going to go to zero. So it was minus 0.55, it's a 1 to 1 to 1 mole ratio, minus 0.55 plus 0.55. At the end, you notice I still have weak base and some of its conjugate acid in roughly a 1 to 1 ratio. That gives us a buffer. So I think these are important uh, 
concepts for you to understand is physically how to make a buffer. And those of you who are in IB, wow, you want to highlight this, circle this, because you're going to have to review this next year. You're going to forget a lot by next year. And you want to keep reviewing over the summer and the fall if you want to do well on your IB test. All right, let's take some examples and see first if we can identify. Uh, key, there's nothing to memorize here. Uh, well, in the sense that you need a week and a week, uh, you can memorize, but you have to be able to identify what a substance is. So this is a strong acid. It's paired with a strong base. I don't have an equilibrium at all in this situation. If there's no equilibrium, then that cannot be a buffer system. Okay, so let's try the next one. Here I have benzoic acid. It's a weak acid. I know that because I've memorized my strong acids and that's not one of them. Hopefully you can recognize that carboxylic acid group there as well. Now, one thing I'm hoping to get you good at is you see that sodium and you got to get rid of it. Get rid of the sodium ion and make that, it's called the benzoate ion. Benzoate ion, once I ditch that sodium ion. Now, that's a weak acid. If a weak acid loses an H+, I get this benzoate. This is my conjugate base. I have a weak and I have a conjugate. So yes, indeed, I have a buffer. See if I can practice making a star here. Yay, that's a buffer situation. All right, now let's take a look at my next one. Zone in on that nitrogen. Remember I told you that weak bases center around a nitrogen, an amine group. Now, bromide is only insoluble if it's with silver, lead, two, mercury, one for our purposes. So let's ditch that ion and that makes this a positive charge. These two differ by the addition of an H+, which means if this is my weak base and I do what bases do best, which is gain that H+, I have a conjugate acid here. So yes, there's another winner. I have another buffer possibility. Let's take a look at this last one. HCl, you've memorized. You notice I'm not giving you any K values here. You have to know your strong acids. Uh, look at the strong acid. Now, let's ditch the sodium ion. And what do I get? I do get the conjugate base, but if it's the, it's the conjugate base of a strong acid, there's no equilibrium system here. If I don't have an equilibrium system, then I don't have a buffer. So the only buffer winners here are two and three. All right, let's try one more thing here. Uh, which of the following would be the best buffer for pH four? Now, if you remember Henderson Hasselbach, pH is equal to pKa plus the log. I, I really like Henderson Hasselbach. Some people don't but I think it's really helpful, especially in this case. All right, um, I can show you a way without it. So let's start with, uh, this is the Henderson Hasselbach. I have Ka is equal to my H plus times my A minus over my HA. That would be for some random acid, weak acid, All right? Now remember, a good buffer has these close to a one-to-one -one ratio. So you can look at it in one of two different ways. We can either think of it as pH being as very close to the pKa is one way to look at it, or you can say the H plus has to be very close to the Ka. Either way you look at it, um, we're going to have to do a conversion. So one of the ways to convert, if pH is four, then the H plus is one times 10 to the minus fourth. And so in that case, 
my winner is going to be the lactic acid. All right? Because this is 1 times 10 to the minus 8, that's too far. This is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 1, that's too far away. So the Ka that's closest to the H plus would be our winner. Now if we did it according to the Henderson-Hasselbach way, we can do a little estimate here. Remember, if this is my power, my pKa, you take one away from that, and I think being able to estimate this is key. So this is seven point something. I don't know what, but I know it's seven point something. For iodic acid, if this is to the negative one, that means when I take minus the log of this, I'm going to get zero point something. And if this is to the negative four, I'm going to get three point something, right? You go down one from the power as long as there's nothing in front, or excuse me, values in front. If there's a one in front, if it's one times 10 to the minus eighth, you just grab that power, all right? So th the key here is the winner is still the lactic acid, because three point something is the closest to my pH of four. So either way, the lactic acid wins as the best choice for this buffer. And so we would devise a method to get roughly equal amounts of lactic acid and its conjugate base. And we're going to take a look at the mathematical portions of that in our next video. So until then, this is signing off.